Breaking tonight with just 18 days until Election Day, Donald Trump is preparing to launch his closing argument, and in a big way, as the polls may show some signs of tightening up yet again. Welcome to The Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. It's been a hectic few hours as the candidates make their final sprint toward Election Day. Hillary Clinton holding a single event in the battleground state of Ohio today, while Donald Trump managed three stops, holding one rally in North Carolina, two in Pennsylvania. Earlier today, he told the crowds he's leaving nothing to chance. Watch. I'm working harder, too, folks. I, will. I am working harder. There's no doubt about it. I've got three stops today. We've got three of these today. We've got three. We're going to do this for another 19 days. Right up until the actual vote of November 8th. And then I don't know what kind of shape I'm in, but I'll be happy. And at least I will have known. Win, lose, or draw, and I'm almost sure if the people come out, we're going to win. But I will be. So, is there reason to believe Trump could still win this race? Larry Sabato and Kristen Saltis Anderson are here on Trump's push to close the polling gap. And Chris Dyerwalt is here with new developments on the House and Senate races. But we begin with our senior national correspondent, John Roberts, reporting from Newtown, Pennsylvania, where Donald Trump just wrapped up his final rally of the day. John? Megan, good evening to you. You know, you say, is there a chance in the next 17 days for Donald Trump to make a difference? He likes to say at many of his campaign rallies, take a look at what was going on in the UK with the Brexit vote. All the polls showed that the no's were going to win and then the yeses won in the end. And he believes he can do the same thing with uh, just a little more than two weeks to go now until people go to the polls en masse. Of course, there's a lot of early voting between now and then as well. Tomorrow in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, very famous place for political speeches, Donald Trump will begin to make his closing arguments. He is going to wrap together all in one place in one speech all of the plans that he says he has for America in the first 100 days of his presidency and what he will do beginning the day that he walks into the Oval Office after taking the oath of office on the west front of the Capitol. Should he be so lucky as to win the presidency? Just a few minutes ago here in Newtown, he gave us an idea of what will be in that agenda. Listen. Apparently, we don't have that. So I will tell you what he's going to do. He's going to talk about tax reform, rebuilding the military, repeal and replace Obamacare, which is a promise he's made in the campaign trail, reduce regulation that he says is handcuffing America's energy producers. He will begin to renegotiate trade deals. He'll begin to get rid of the Iran deal and renegotiate that. Uh, tax uh, cuts. Uh, also, his five-point plan to reform ethics in Washington and something new in the campaign trail, saying that in the Department of Commerce, he will create in the first days of his presidency, a so-called America desk, which will be tasked with preserving American jobs and setting the playing field for American companies to flourish. So tomorrow morning, Megan, 11 a.m., we'll see if he can turn the poll numbers around. One glimmer of hope here, a new Investors Business Daily national poll has got him one point ahead of Hillary Clinton, but he still trails in 11 of the 16 so-called battleground states. Mm -hmm. Megan? Real clear polling average went one-tenth of one person weight, uh, one percent uh, in Donald Trump's favor today, but <laughs> it's very tight and her lead is pretty solid. John, good to see you. So over the past five months, some context now in the polling. Watch this. Even when Hillary Clinton's lead appeared to be getting to the point of insurmountable, Donald Trump has repeatedly, repeatedly been, been able to bounce back. For example, in early May, he was down six and a half points, only to move ahead just two weeks later. It happened again over the summer. In late June, the businessman was trailing the former Secretary of State by nearly seven points. Four weeks later, just after the Republican National Convention, he was back in the lead. And it was a similar story at the end of August. He trailed by nearly six points. He had attacked the Khan family, all that nonsense, after the Democrats' convention. Just over two weeks later, it was a dead heat. Today, Hillary Clinton is ahead by just over 6% in the real clear politics average of all polls. And the question now is whether Trump can once again be the new comeback kid as we approach election day. Larry Sabato is the director of the University of Virginia Center for Politics. And Kristen Soltis Anderson is a Washington Examiner columnist and a Republican pollster. Good to see you both. Good to see you. So he's done it. I mean, he, Larry, he has done it at least three times. If you want to look at like tighter times, you could, you could go back further than that. But he's, he's been counted for dead many times before and has come back. Is it possible between now and November 8th? 
Uh, Megan, anything's theoretically possible. I certainly wouldn't bet on it. It's very, very unlikely. This is a sizable lead by Hillary Clinton. Uh, people say, oh, what's six points? Why polls turn around quickly? This is the end of the campaign. We're, we're at the end, this final phase. People have made up their minds, and the vast majority have made them up solidly. They're not going to be switching, certainly between Clinton and Trump. There may be a few who switch back and forth between one of the major party candidates and one of the minor party candidates, but that's about it. And don't forget about early voting, too. We've got three to four million who've already voted, and we'll have about 40% of the electorate having voted before November 8th. Christian, do you agree? Because Trump, if you look at the history of how Trump has closed the gap, we can put this on the board, uh, he's done it in two weeks in the past. Look at May. May 6th, Clinton was up 6.5. By May 22nd, he had taken the lead, a swing of 6, you know, 0.7 points. Um, and then you can see a little bit longer between June 28th and July 25th, but not even a full month there. And once again, he had taken the lead from a 6.8% from deficit. I think it is yeah, a little well, bit easier to... to make up a gap like that in May when people are still trying to figure out what are the issues that matter to them, trying to get their heads around who these candidates really are and what they're standing for, than it is by the time we get to late October when, as Larry mentioned, lots of people have already made up their minds. Nine out of ten supporters of Clinton say in polls that they will not change their minds. Nine out of ten Trump supporters say they will not change their minds. People are so kind of down in their bunkers about who they're voting for at this point that really the slice of people left who can be persuaded is very small. Mm -hmm. The way you can persuade people is not to switch from Trump to Clinton or Clinton to Trump at this point. It's to vote or to not vote. And so the one thing that I think Trump could potentially do is if he's able to go and hit like a laser just those states that he needs to put together 270. As you mentioned, he's been doing these rallies. Rallies are sort of the thing that he's the best at. He's better at that than the Democrats are. But the thing that he's got working against him is that there's the Democratic machine. In the Republican primary, he was able to overcome the turnout operation of folks like Ted Cruz, but it's a whole different ball game up against the Democratic turnout machine. And so he's got to really make sure that these rallies are turning out lots of people if he wants to energize his supporters enough to try to begin to make up this gap. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I'm with Larry. I, I think that it's highly unlikely that he's able to pull it off. And if he does, he's got to focus like a laser on just the states he needs to What about to win. Larry? Because one of the times he managed to close that gap uh, as, we, as we looked at that chart was right after September 11th when she collapsed I and mean, when she physically collapsed and then her polls collapsed. I mean, does he need an event as big as that, in your view, to turn this around at this point? As big or bigger, and I'm not even sure that would do it for some of the reasons that Kristen just mentioned. Uh, the undecided percentage, my guess is it's two, three, four max. And from experience, we know that half of them won't vote. They don't show up. They're conflicted or they're not used to the voting procedures. And of those who vote, the tradition is that they break about in the same proportions as the electorate as mm -hmm. a whole. So, no, I, and I don't believe that people who are intending to vote are not going to vote at this point. I just don't buy it. So I have this question for both of you. I'm actually going to ask you of Larry first, though. What do you think was the moment that did it for Trump? You know, he, he surged and then he fell back and he surged and then he fell back. And then, you know, what, what was it in your view if, if this is how the election pans whether or not he was going to acknowledge the vote uh, once it had been cast. Uh, and let's not forget about um, the uh, Access Hollywood tape mm -hmm. and the other events that occurred after that. So it's a combination of things, but also it's the basic party ID and the, the leaning, the demographic leaning.
<laughs> I'm so proud of you, counselor. I never thought in all my days I'd get to hear you say that. <laughs> They're Good getting a little worried about the down ballot situation. Not as much in the House as in the Senate, but in the House, too. Is that a real fear? Yeah, uh, it's getting to be. So it basically goes like this. For the House, uh, it generally reflects what is happening at the top of the ticket. Uh, the Senate, as we've seen this time, individual Republican senators like Rob Portman in Ohio, Marco Rubio in Florida, have been able to rise dramatically above Trump's poll numbers and outperform him in those states. And so the Republicans are feeling more confident, interestingly enough, about their chances to limit the Democrats to f fewer than four seats picked up and that they might be able to hold on to the Senate. But on the House side, you see much more correlation with the national popular presidential vote. And if that's the case, the Republicans have 30 seats of a majority. That looks like a great deal. But if things go all whopper jawed, if this, if this falls apart, uh, then you could see that perhaps in danger. All right. So it, assuming they don't lose, you know, a, a net loss of 30, the Republicans right. in the House, and they just, let's say they lose 20, <laughs> yeah. but they still have the majority. Do we care? I mean, how much of a difference does that make? Well, that's one of the reasons, in fact, right now that I think Republicans are going along with the whole Donald Trump rigatoni uh, recipe here, that it's the, they're, they're playing along with this because they want voters to keep believing. Because if they just lose five seats, six seats, like had, had happened in bad losses in 1988 and 1996 for the losing parties, that's okay. Then they can handle it. But if it starts to dip down and you start talking about a number like 20, they don't have a functional majority anymore because the Republicans are always chasing each other around with billy clubs, crushing each other's skulls mm -hmm. open. And then if Hillary Clinton wins, then guess what happens? She's facing no opposition. She's facing a, a majority that can't, or a majority in the House that can't even block her because they can't agree. So that would be the Democratic hope. Grind that Republican majority if they can't beat it grind it down to a nubbin and leave paul ryan unable to do anything over there but weep what two senate races are you watching the most closely like is the republican incumbent in the biggest danger of losing his or her seat well, there are two. The, uh, Mark Kirk in Illinois is a lost cause. That's not going to happen for the Republicans. So that's one. Ron Johnson in Wisconsin looks pretty tough. He's he's outperformed. Uh, so those those are two. Kelly Ayotte in New Hampshire and Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania are sort of the waterline on the Senate. If they can fight back, it's it, they're starting to feel some downdraft from Trump. Kelly Ayotte's now states. eight points below, according to the latest poll. Uh, she's and eight points behind for the first time. And, and that separate, they're losing some of their separation in those blue states as Democratic voters and persuadable moderates turn against Trump. So they got a problem up there. So that's where I'd say the waterline is New Hampshire and Pennsylvania. Wow. Starwell, great to see you. Dig it. <laughs> he's dig it and McKinnon's kick it. And he's coming up later. With just 18 days to go until the election, Charles Krauthammer has just announced how he is voting. And he is here next with the news. President can't just pop off or lash out irrationally. And I think we can all agree that someone who's roaming around at 3 a.m. tweeting should not have their fingers on the nuclear codes. We all know that if we let Hillary's opponent win this election, then we are sending a clear message to our kids. Everything they're seeing and hearing is perfectly okay. We are validating it. We are endorsing it. You do not keep American democracy in suspense. Because look, too many people have marched and protested and fought and died for this democracy. That was First Lady Michelle Obama and some of her remarks from a series of campaign trail appearances where she has hit Donald Trump as dangerous for the country. Tonight for the first time, Mr. Trump is responding. We have a bunch of babies running our country, folks. We have a bunch of losers. They're losers. They're babies. We have a president. All he wants to do is campaign. His wife, all she wants to do is campaign. And I see how much his wife likes Hillary. But wasn't she the one that originally started the statement, if you can't take care of your home, right? You can't take care of the White House or the country. Joining me now, Attorney David Wool, who's a Trump supporter and a Fox News, and also Fox News contributor Julie Riginski, who's a Democrat. Good to see you both. Great to see you. So oh, you this, this, people <laughs> lost it when when Trump responded. Now, there's a question about whether he has accurately quoted Michelle Obama, which we can get to. But let me just start with you, David, on the people who are like, "What is he doing? You don't attack Michelle Obama. She has huge approval ratings," which she does. 
don't go there, especially because you have a woman problem. Was he out of line? So she can launch a verbal barrage of verbal missiles at Mr. Trump, and he's supposed to just sit there and take it, I guess, Megan. No, there's going to be blowback, as there always is. Look, she's a well-spoken, brilliant woman. She's inserted herself into the political process on numerous occasions, and when she goes after Trump, he's going to hit back. Now, what Trump said, as I recall, it was referring sort of, at least in a double entendre way, regarding Bill Clinton's philandering and womanizing and the alleged sexual assaults. But let's assume that it wasn't. Let's assume she was, uh, the, the statements were regarding child care, Megan. Just sit with you. Can you just pause there, David, because I want to tell them what we're talking about. Let me, let me just. Sure, no, you, so, I got it. So what she had said, um, this is back uh, in 2007, Michelle Obama said, one of the things, the important aspects of this race is role modeling what good families should look like. And my view is that if you can't run your own house, you certainly can't run the White House. But then apparently she made similar comments on the stump in another appearance shortly thereafter, Julie, where she expanded and said, so we've adjusted our schedules to make sure that our girls are first. So while he's traveling around, I do day trips. Hence the confusion about whether she was initially at that first appearance taking a shot at Hillary or whether she's just trying to say this is how Barack and I do it. Well, look, I mean, if you take her at her word as to what she was saying, you read the totality of her speech in Iowa, which I did. She was clearly talking about the fact that they were a new family to America. She was introducing herself and her husband to, to the American voter and talking about how they managed their family and talking about how they managed campaigning for president while being parents of two young girls. So, you know, let's let's put that aside. I actually agree with, with David to this point. She has he has every right to attack Michelle Obama. She's fair game. Of course she's fair game. She inserted herself, as David said. She talks about him. She says not so nice things about him. He's, of course, more than entitled to, to go get back at her. I don't think it's smart politics, but it's not unfair. Why? And Well, because for the following reason. She is the most popular uh, public figure in the United States right now. She's a woman. He's got a woman problem. And more importantly, by going after her, it brings up what she has said about him. And she's not a messenger he wants to re-engage. Because if we're looping over and over again, as we just did, her attacks on him, that's not good for Donald Trump. But the I thing would not is, David, you, you tell me, I mean, we, we, women do want to be treated equally. Trump gets into trouble when he starts, you know, calling us sexist names. But when he attacks a woman, not on the basis of any sort of women terms, if you will, but just you know, like, I don't like her or she's no, she's not smart or she's what. That's fair game. We're, we're, he can attack mm -hmm. women, right? That's, that is this, equality. Yeah. It, I mean, it's the major leagues. And let's assume that Michelle Obama was talking about putting her family first and politics second. I think the implication, Megan, was that Hillary Clinton puts her political ambition first and raising Chelsea second. That's even worse than the implication of womanizing and philandering by Bill. So either way you look at it, it was bad. And by, this is Trump taking a shot at Hillary Clinton, not so much at, at M Michelle Obama, because this is what Michelle said. There's no disputing that. Yeah, this but is he a, was saying our country is being run by losers. We have a bunch of losers and babies running our country. And then he spoke well, about true. the president and the first lady. Political correctness has completely ruined things, Megan. And that's his <laughs> bottom line. And that's why he's saying it ain't going to happen anymore. And by the way, I don't, I don't agree with the naysayers in the first two segments. I really believe this volatile campaign is flipping. Watch what happens in the next couple of weeks. Wow. I'm just telling you. Go ahead, Julie. I'll just say this. That loser that he was alluding to won a presidential election two times in a row. <laughs> And so that's something that Donald Trump is not going to be doing <laughs> next month. So right, let's well. start with that. And secondly, nobody's ever said the people have said horrible things about uh, Hillary Clinton. I've never heard anybody say she was a bad mother. That's a new one, even for me. And I've heard it all thrown at her. So yeah. I don't know where you're getting that information about her. And she's Chelsea. had she's had plenty. He's saying yeah. he's he's suggesting perhaps that's how Michelle mm. meant it. Right. I don't don't know anyway. about that. OK, great to see you both. Also okay. tonight, newly leaked campaign emails raising tough new questions about the Clinton Foundation and what was behind a multi-million dollar donation from Morocco. Wait until you hear how much she got and she promised them and in exchange for what? And how many favors is she going to owe if she gets into office? Plus, Charles Krauthammer is announcing how he's going to vote this year right after this break. Well, this election year has seen more than its fair share of scandals, controversies, leaked emails, ugly videos like that. It's featured brutal debates, crazy conventions. And after all of that, after the nonstop drama we've seen every day for more than a year, new polling shows Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are exactly where they were with the voters 10 months ago.
When it comes to likability, 40% view Clinton positively, 29% view Trump that way, same way as it was almost a year ago. And the spread in the polls is exactly where it was a year ago as well. Nothing has changed. So did anything that happened this year matter? Joining me now, Fox News contributor and nationally syndicated columnist, Charles Krauthammer. Charles, good to see you. Did good any of it matter? Well, in a sense, I think this has been one of the worst years for American democracy in general. It's been one of the lowest, at least elevating campaigns ever. And we have not been enriched or enlightened by it. I think the reason things are the same is because we've never had two candidates who were better known at the beginning. Name recognition way up there, uh, in the, probably in the 90s before they started. In other words, people knew who they were and character is destiny. We got a year of them on the stage and they basically showed us their character, mm -hmm. which is what we thought it was at the beginning, untrustworthy, uh, unfit in some cases, cynical, etc. And we are where we are. Nothing really has changed in that respect other than we've reached uh, lows in tactics, in incivility that we really didn't think we'd ever see at the presidential level. Mm -hmm. And so you you find yourself in a similar place to where you've been all along as well in in your column this week saying you you still cannot vote for donald trump we're two weeks out now from the election you say you cannot do it and you cannot vote for hillary clinton so you're going to write somebody in who who are you going to write in and why why do you think that's the best choice well look I, it's a question of conscience the fact is i cannot vote for donald trump i thought that on the day he announced i said it that night i i said on special report i didn't think he was even a serious candidate i got that wrong about the fact that he wouldn't be a factor but i think i got it right that he's unfit for the presidency and i have never changed my mind on that as to hillary the dilemma i studied out in my column today in the washington post uh, she's a cynical politician with an empty core where her beliefs are supposed to be to the extent she has them. It's conventional liberal, uh, which I think is a threat to the Constitution. And you saw in the last debate where she said basically the point of the Supreme Court is to defend the little guy. The oath of office for a judge is to say that he does not explicitly they have to swear not to recognize rich or poor. This mm -hmm. is complete overturning of the point of the law. You know, right now, if you were just going to go by the polls, it would look like Hillary's going to win. You know, I mean, she's, yeah. she's considerably ahead. Um, so what, I mean, what, what does the public do when someone who, you know, as you, as you point out in your column, because you speak for a lot of people, and saying you find her campaign entirely soulless, all ambition and entitlement, it's emptiness at the core, you say, in her that makes every policy and position negotiable and politically calculable. And you've seen, you felt con validated in those, those beliefs by what you've seen in the WikiLeaks, which show a lot of soullessness, somebody who doesn't yeah. really have a core message. So how, how does the country come behind someone like Hillary Clinton if she does win this? Well, it's because she went through the process. That's the only reason. And the process has to be elevated above everything else. Look, I was not a Barack Obama supporter, but when he won the election in 08, he was the president of all of us. I've been very critical of him, but that's how you end up where you end up. I would have preferred first African-American to have been a Condoleezza Rice or somebody else. Mm -hmm. And yet I felt a pride when he was sworn in that our country had come that far. So she's going to have to earn whatever she gets at the presidency, but she will, if she wins, she will have earned at least the respect of the office when she's there. So we're going to leave the audience in suspense, and we'll have you back after Election Day to find out what you did. Charles, great to see you. And, and how I swayed the vote, yes. <laughs> All the best. Well, both Mr. Trump and Mrs. Clinton went hard on their rival at last night's Al Smith dinner. So how do you think the media covered that? Howie Kurtz is here with the answer. Plus, with embarrassing new revelations from the WikiLeaks dump of Clinton campaign emails, Mark McKinnon is here on the difference this makes in the final 18 days. The circus, next. 
Clinton Foundation exists as a temptation for any foreign entity or government that believes it could curry favor through a donation. I will certainly uh, do everything in my uh, power to make sure that uh, the good work of the foundation continues without there being any untoward effects uh, on me and my service uh, and be very conscious of uh, any questions that are raised. That was Hillary Clinton at her Senate confirmation hearings in 2009, trying to calm concerns about any conflict of interest with her work at the Clinton Foundation. Now some newly leaked emails are suggesting that there was reason for those concerns as we learn that she may have been personally responsible for securing a $12 million donation from the Moroccan royal family, although it appears to have come after her tenure as secretary. Our chief national correspondent, Ed Henry, joins us live. Ed? Good evening, Megan. Hillary Clinton, in fact, did line up this big contribution from the king, according to her own close aide, Huma Abedin. She put this in a January 2015 email. She created this mess, she said of Clinton, and she knows it. The mess referring to Clinton initially agreeing to speak at a May 2015 Clinton Global initiative event in Morocco. Political reported at the time a $1 million contribution was going to stoke more controversy, though, uh, and so they didn't want to do that event. It turns out the money was far bigger, $12 million, bucks, according to Abedin, responding to top aides Robbie Mook and John Podesta, who were worried it would harm the April 2015 launch of the former Secretary of State's campaign. In a new email released today by WikiLeaks, Abedin was adamant, writing, quote, no matter what happens, she will be in Morocco hosting CGI on May 5th to the 7th, 2015. Her presence was a condition for the Moroccans to proceed, so there is no going back on this. It makes you wonder what the king was expecting in return beyond just access. Because in 2011, Clinton's State Department charged the Moroccan government had human rights problems. And remember, at this week's debate, Donald Trump demanded Clinton give back large contributions from countries with questionable records. She never quite answered that or this from Chris Wallace. Why isn't it what Mr. Trump calls pay to play? Well, everything I did as Secretary of State was in furtherance of uh, our country's interests and our values. The State Department has said that. Now, the Moroccan event ended up being led by Bill and Chelsea Clinton. Hillary Clinton did skip it, though she lined up that $12 million contribution. Clinton ally Lanny Davis told me the focus should be on the good work of the foundation. And he said Aberdeen's email should not be taken, quote, too literally. Megan. And thank you. Joining me now with more, Mark McKinnon, co-creator and co-host of the weekly documentary series, The Circus on Showtime. And he served as the chief media advisor to President George W. Bush. Mark, good to see you. Hi. So it's not that she necessarily violated that promise she made to the Senate, you know, by, by working this while she was secretary, because this happened after she was secretary. But the point is, the Clinton Foundation creates all sorts of conflicts for her. So she's trying to line up a $12 million donation to Clinton Foundation. She's going to speak. I'll be there in Morocco. I know it looks bad, but I'm doing it. She winds up sending Bill and Hillary, uh, Bill and Chelsea because it becomes an issue. But what was the king expecting? And if she becomes president now, how many favors is this woman going to owe? And what, what about they're not promising to shut down that that foundation? No. And in fact, this is just part of the problem because almost every day in the leaks, there's a new disclosure like this. I mean, just the other day, there was a disclosure from, about Cutter and a million dollar contribution that was, quote, for a birthday present for Bill Clinton, uh, possibly. And, and, with the, uh, and there's still no clear answer on that. And so we've had the debate. So there's no more debates to change the dynamic. And that's the, the, the real opportunity where the candidates have to move the needle in a significant way. So the only real thing between now and Election Day that can really have an impact are, is WikiLeaks. And it is and it can and it will be because we know that there's more to come. The ones that have already come out haven't really been answered. If Donald Trump will simply get some message discipline to stay on this issue, mm. there's some real opportunity here. But let, let, I'll challenge you on that okay. because in Trump's defense, you know, he comes after the media hard, yeah. and some of it is whiny and you know, this is yeah. it's tough. It's tough to run yeah. for president. You get hit, but but some of it is legit because the the story of WikiLeaks has been ignored in so many corners, all but ignored in most. Agree 100 percent, and that's why, for example, the the title of the circus this week is from Russia with love. It's going to be all on WikiLeaks. The whole program is going to be on WikiLeaks. We're, we're talking about, we're looking at it from every angle. I know, you, history, hit up, you hit Harry Reid saying, hey, WikiLeaks, yeah. and of course it's all about like, Russia's bad, Russia's yeah. bad. It's like, what about the fact that she called them needy Latinos? Right? Yeah. Like, they're nothing. No yeah. one seems to care. We're going to look at it. We talked to Tucker Carlson about how the mainstream media is doing exactly what you said. And NBC, you know, he, he has 11 reporters on it every day, and NBC didn't say a word about it a week ago. So He's just a website, with all due respect to Tucker, That's what he right? said. No, yeah, that's, that's what he said. Point. I'm just like, a website, and I've got 11 people working right, on where's it. Where's the media? Because listen, if the media wants to shine a yeah. light on something, they can take, for example, the access 
Miss Hollywood tape, which was huge, there's no question. But the stuff that's coming out, the, I have a theory on it. We as reporters are lazy. And if you don't make it very easy for us, to digest and spoon to the audience, many of us will reject it as, yeah. as food for the evening. Yeah. Well, I know for just from the reporting we're doing this week that because of kind of the vacuum that's out there now, there's no debates, they are starting to talk about this. And a bunch of the, I mean, some of the organizations that we are with today mm -hmm. have got big stories coming out in the next few days. Oh, this really? Is mainstream media. Yeah, tune in. Really? They're on it now. L last question. Sure. Um, how badly do you think that Trump answer hurt him at that debate about not accepting the results of the election necessarily? I think the answer itself was problematic, but the bigger problem was that it just, it became such a story that it dominated all the news for the next couple of days. So in many regards, it was a good debate performance. There were lots of opportunities where he had Clinton on the defense, but by going there, instead of walking that back like his campaign wanted to, he walked it off the cliff, mm -hmm. and that just became the, the dominant news for the next couple of days, and people are still talking about it. Mark, great to see you. You know what you got to do. Kick it. That's right. Kick it hard. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Check out The Circus on Showtime. It's worth your time. So Donald Trump took some hits in the press today. You're shocked to hear, I know, for his attacks on Hillary Clinton at the Al Smith dinner last night in New York. But Mrs. Clinton gave it back to him pretty well at that dinner, which you know if you were watching it with us here. You might not know that if you picked up any paper at all today. Howie Kurtz is next on how the media handled this one. Hillary accidentally bumped into me, and she very civilly said, pardon me. <laughs> this is the first time ever, ever, that Hillary is sitting down and speaking to major corporate leaders and not getting paid for it. We've learned so much from WikiLeaks. For example, here she is tonight in public, pretending not to hate Catholics. Well, those are just a few of the jokes Donald Trump made about Hillary Clinton during his remarks at last night's Al Smith dinner in New York. The speech got awkward at times since the humor was supposed to be good natured and self deprecating. It was generally more like just deprecating. And here's a little of how Mrs. Clinton responded. I think the Cardinal is saying I'm not eligible for sainthood. But getting through these three debates with Donald has to count as a miracle. <laughs> People look at the Statue of Liberty and they see a proud symbol of our history as a nation of immigrants. Donald looks at the Statue of Liberty and sees a four. <laughs> Maybe a five if she loses the torch and tablet and changes her hair. Donald really is as healthy as a horse. You know, the one Vladimir Putin rides around on. So while both candidates pulled no punches, the headline writers missed that. The New York Times focused on how Trump was heckled by the New York elite. Bloomberg seemed to think Trump's jokes struck a sour tone. Nothing about her in the headline. NPR declaring Trump turned a, quote, friendly roast into a three-alarm fire. Mrs. Clinton, she pretty much got a pass. But there were lovely articles about how well she was dressed. Joining me now, host of Fox News Media Buzz, Howard Kurtz. Now, personally, I thought the Statue of Liberty joke was kind of funny. Uh, yeah. But the Putin joke with the horse, that was, right? And there Not were so others much. where she, she got pretty cutting to suggesting that Barack Obama wasn't going get, to get into any gathering uh, of Trump with former presidents because of his Muslim ban. Maybe it was that they're not good at delivering jokes, right? Like, they, they, they're not funny. But... You tell me whether this was biased coverage. Megan, from watching the coverage over the last 24 hours, you would have the impression that Donald Trump walked into St. Patrick's Cathedral and spray painted the stained glass <laughs> windows. Uh, you know, I didn't get to see it live. And it's not a good thing when the Republican nominee gets booed at a Catholic charity dinner. Uh, and I didn't think him talking about joking, joking about Hillary hating Catholics was a good move, especially he's referring to some references in the hacked emails or from Clinton advisors. But I, I didn't know until I talked to people who were in the room that Hillary Clinton had some uncomfortable moments as well. Mm -hmm. Right. There was some booing of her, although I will say we covered it live here on the Kelly file last night. And it was interesting because we, we put a pundit on camera right after he was done who went after Trump saying you're supposed to be self-deprecating, supposed to be about yourself, supposed to be kind of singe, don't burn, like the gridiron dinner. And then she got up, and the first thing I said after she was done was, and she did it too, right? But the, the, you, I mean, Howie, the media, 
they're done with Trump. And I get it. Like, they're, they're frustrated. They think he's this. They think he's that. But it's not their job to try to ruin him. I think there is so much hostility in many quarters, cor corners of the mainstream media against Donald Trump, and we see this in a thousand different ways. But it's also classic media behavior when a candidate is struggling and slipping in the polls and this after the third debate in Las Vegas. Uh, every little misstep becomes a metaphor for how poorly he's doing. You know, uh, his limo got a flat tire. He's going nowhere, that sort of thing. But it's on <laughs> steroids when it comes to Trump. And yet there's nothing he can do about it. And you tell me whether there's something big that comes out of WikiLeaks, whether that even that whether that could be a potential game changer given that mindset i think that as the drip 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 of these wikileaks disclosures has happened there's been a little bit more coverage than there was at the beginning uh about the embarrassments for hillary clinton and her campaign the problem is some of it's complicated it takes a while to explain most of it the exception of this latest one about the 12 million do donation by the king of morocco doesn't involve hillary clinton personally but more than any of that Trump is always the story, and uh, the, the coverage of him, most of it negative, but always he's always driving the story, um, blots out uh, what ordinarily would be very big disclosures by WikiLeaks against the Clinton campaign. Howie Kurtz, great to see you. We'll Thank be right back. Maggie. So in the average of all polls, Trump is behind 6.2 percentage points right now. Do you believe he can turn it around in the next 18 days? Facebook.com slash The Kelly File on Twitter at Megan Kelly. Let me know what you think. Thanks for watching. Good night.